Hi there. My name is Rainy Reitman. I'm the Activism Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And we are going to be having a on Facebook live conversation today about the election and what that means for digital rights. And I am joined by my colleague, uh, Danny O'Brien. Um, Danny. Hey. Hi. I'm so glad to have you here today. I'm glad to be here. So Danny uh, has 20 years of experience in tech policy advocacy. And you used to be with uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists. That's right. And then you were with EFF back when, uh, back when you were the only activist with EFF. Is that correct? I, was, I wasn't activist number one. There was an activist before me. But we were serial activists rather than parallel, which yeah. is what we have now. Uh, yes. Uh, much smaller team, and then you found you co-founded the Open Rights Group. Yeah, which is the UK's equivalent of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Fantastic, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you also coined the term life hack. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Talking of parallel, that was a slightly different parallel universe. But I, um, if you've ever been annoyed at the gradual dilution of the term hack from meaning a very specific sort of programming thing to just being able to tie your shoelaces correctly, that, that, is, that is my responsibility. I do apologize. Yes, and we, we all blame you for it. So, <laughs> um, so last week, we, we had a very special event here in San Francisco. We had uh, members come in and join us for a, a, a round of drinks, and we, we talked to them about how the recent election of Donald Trump uh, impacts the future of digital rights and what that really means. We had a very candid conversation, and you led that conversation. And I did. afterwards, I realized that it was uh, frustrating that we hadn't had more people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, the the room was packed. Just just to be clear, I mean, what 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 we do is um, whenever anybody goes around the world um, at EFF, we try and organize speakeasies, which is where uh, members of EFF, people who have joined and are supporting us, can come and ask us questions um, face to face. And we, we plan to have one. We have regular ones here in our offices in San Francisco or nearby. Um, and this one was something that we had planned anyway. Um, I was planned to speak. And it turned out that, that there were far more questions about the election than perhaps people had anticipated um, before that night. So we talked a little bit about what our, our plans had been. And, um, and I'm hoping that we can share that too. And, and we got a lot of feedback from the people in the audience. And I'm hoping that we can find some, some feedback from uh, you people out there too. Yeah, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be having a sort of uh, going through some of the things that Danny had said during the speakeasy. And the, uh, the uh, other thing we're going to be doing is we're actually going to invite people from the community to post their own questions. So uh, if you have questions for Danny or for me, uh, you can uh, tweet them at us using the hashtag uh, Ask EFF, and then uh, you can also post them on Facebook. And uh, we have a friend uh, off screen named Maggie, and Maggie is going to be pulling those questions. Thank you, Maggie. Maggie is waving. Uh, Maggie's going to be pulling those questions. She's going to be handing them to me on note cards. I've already got several, and uh, and uh, we're going to be answering them on screen. Uh, and uh, and why don't we why don't we just get started? Yeah, I mean, usually we to, we kind of do this little talking in the beginning to give people time to to gather. But I, I looking through here, I think I see enough people. So. I think that's true. Right. So um, I wanted to start off with the question that we started the speakeasy off with last week, and uh, the exact question was um, was it was it was submitted before the election results came in, and it was. Uh, does EFF have a specific game plan if he who shall not be named uh, wins the election? And now we learn to say his name. So yes. you have to say President-elect okay. Donald J. Trump. I'm okay. going to have to Keep saying it. You've got that. four years of it. <laughs> so um, uh, yes, we did. We, we, we did have a plan. I'm not sure we would describe it as a specific plan, because one of the things that made uh, this election period particularly unusual is that the in a lot of ways, it wasn't won through policy specifics. Um, it's not as if um, uh, uh, the incoming president came with knowledges uh, of, of policies about technology. Um, that said, that we, we, we knew the, the general pattern. And, and so far, um, that pattern has been absolutely reflected. In, in what we've seen. Um, the first part of that is what we knew if Donald Trump won, won the election, um, he would be coming in uh, as an outsider 
um, and as a disruptive outsider. So he was be coming in with an entirely new set of people. But that was going to be a very small core of people. And one of the natures of the transition in the uh, US election system is there's a huge number of seats to fill um, within the federal government. And so it was inevitable that that was going to suck in a lot of people that we did know something about. The other thing about disruptive events in Washington that EFF has been very familiar with in our 30 years of existence is that many, many people who are already there see it as an opportunity. Um, to dust down uh, laws and proposals that have failed um, previously, um, often failed because we've successfully fought them, uh, and brought them back again. If any of you were around and EFF members in uh, 2001, um, uh, the day after 9-11, I mean, you'll know that, that, that we were aware of what was going to be in the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act did not appear as a hundreds of pages that were just written within that week. So one of the things that we're anticipating is a lot of people would take this as an opportunity and take advantage of the sort of fear, I think is a fair description of it, uh, an atmosphere of, of, um, of, of concern um, uh, to push their existing agenda and many of those agendas against us. The other thing I would say is that um, EFF has support from across the political spectrum. And in the United States, that means we have members, supporters, and activists from the Republican Party, from the Democrat Party, Democratic Party, um, from Libertarians and Greens. I think it would be fair to say, and we've been keeping a close eye on uh, the, the, the team that's forming, that um, uh, Mr. Trump is drawing from a part of the Republican Party that um, uh, has, has not been friendly to civil liberties uh, in this time. So, so we are expecting a, a tough fight, um, both in DC and, um, and elsewhere. I think that's very true. So if you're, if you're just joining us, we're having a conversation with EFF International Director Danny O'Brien, and we're taking comments and questions so you can post to the Facebook group or you can tweet at us uh, using the hashtag Ask EFF, and I have a colleague here will be actually handing me, oh, she has one right here, questions that we'll be asking uh, Danny live here online. And so uh, we really appreciate uh, your support and your questions. And I think the second question I want to ask is, um, you know, Danny, we're in this, we're in this rough spot uh, where, where we're looking at, as you said, some policies that are very unfriendly to the positions that EFF has been pushing for the last several years, for, for most, for 20 plus years. Um, what do you think EFF can even do about some of these things? So I think that's a fair question. I think I, I, I know talking to people, I mean, that's, that's what people ask about themselves. And I know speaking to um, the many organizations that make up the sort of digital rights community now that they're asking themselves. Um, I think there are a couple of things that, that, are, that are interesting about this. Um, one is that um, if you think it's bad where you are, if you're, if you're um, concerned or confused about what's going on, um, just, just imagine what it's like in DC right now. So a lot of people, um, a lot of our colleagues um, uh, had some expectation, a reasonable expectation perhaps, um, that, that this, this, this transition would move to the Clinton administration. They're now faced with a situation where um, uh, there's a bunch of new people they might not necessarily have contacts with, and uh, two of the, um, uh, the, the, the parts of government, are now three really, uh, are now um, in a very different place. So you have a new presidency with a lot of uh, unknown faces and a lot of known faces too. So I mean, just to give you an example of what we're facing, um, uh, I was looking through the transition team list and one I, name that called my, my I was, um, was, was, was Marsha Blackburn, and we, we, we dealt with Marsha before. Marsha proposed um, way back a amendment that would actually uh, expand the federal government's powers to prevent um, uh, community mesh networks and municipal 
Wi-Fi alternatives, municipal network alternatives. And so that was like an expansion of government, which is not something that we're used to um, in, a, in sort of a Republican frame of mind. So uh, Marsh has also spoken out very strongly against net neutrality. Um, Jeff Eisenbach, who's the transition team's uh, leader of tech policy, um, is another strong speaker uh, against uh, net neutrality. Um, he headed up um, the Progress and Freedom Foundation, which I think is, is fair to say, and I think they would agree with me, the folks there, in some ways was the diametric opposite of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It, it's sort of like if you imagine we had the, if you imagine the EFF logo and it had a little goatee and a sash on it, that would be the Progress and Freedom Foundation. And these are the people that are going to be um, leading the transition team. So, so very few people have contact. So how, where does that leave EFF? Well, I think one of the things that's important to realize is that it leaves us where we are now, which is San Francisco. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has not been a Washington DC shop for many, many years now, for almost uh, 20 years. Um, we left DC uh, partly because we saw strengths in other ways of doing things. Um, the way that EFF is organized, for those of you who don't know, is we sort of, we sort of form a, a, a pyramid of, of, of power. That makes it sound like it's a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a cult. But, um, um, so so those, those three things are um, uh, technology. We have technologists. We use the law. And we use activism. And just to explain how we'll use those, those capabilities in the upcoming years. Um, so law is a, is a really important one. If you think of the setup that we have now, where the Republican Party um, is running, uh, has, has majorities in both Congress and Senate and the White House, uh, in times like that, it's traditionally the judiciary um, that the, the burden falls on to rein back um, um, the power of the executive. Now, I know that a lot of people are, um, are concerned on the either side of the fence about the Supreme Court. But it, of course, the, 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 the judiciary in the United States is a huge, huge beast. And it's distributed. And that's what's really important. We have different circuits which come to different decisions. And EFF fights in all of those, those circuits. Um, we're very used to challenging executive power through the courts. Our, our great colleagues who we work with a, a, a lot at the ACLU um, led their, um, their front page with, uh, see you in court, Mr. Trump. And that's definitely something that we, we can imagine ourselves doing. We fought against the um, uh, Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration in the courts, and we're going to fight Mr. Trump. The other thing that's worth saying is that um, for those of you who aren't local, to um, California, you probably have missed this, but um, the Californian legislature and executive themselves have formed a very strongly oppositional force to, uh, to uh, Donald Trump's administration immediately. Um, there was a very strongly um, worded letter from uh, the joint leaders of the legislature. And we've had a lot of experience and a lot of um, uh, wins uh, here in California. So uh, I think one of our biggest legislative whims in the last year was a, a thing called CALECPA. And CALECPA was a California and a state level attempt to fill in some of the um, civil liberties holes in the United States' um, federal electronic communications protections. Um, and that was great because by passing a law in California, we also were able to throw up a protective shield across the entire world, because the law as it applies in California is the law that applies to Apple, it's the law that applies to Facebook, and it's the law that applies to uh, Google. And so that means that now, when government officials from the United States want to get information from those companies, they have to follow CALECPA. So I imagine that we're also going to spend um, some time in the California courts, in the California legislature, and across the rest of the United States. Um, activism is another important part of our role, um, and um, actually, I happen to have with me um, the uh, director of activism at the Electronic Freedom Found uh, Frontier Foundation, um, uh, and yes, that is. I, I am a, I am the activism yeah. director here, so maybe I should take that part. Yeah, go I'll go go ahead. Go go so, for that. Um, so Danny was describing for those of you just joining. Uh, Danny was sort of talking about well, what's EFF's larger strategy on these issues. 
And um, we are taking questions, by the way. If you haven't, uh, you can tweet at us uh, using the hashtag AskEFF, and you can post comments here on Facebook. Um, and so we're talking about these three different prongs that we use to tackle problems. And we just went through how we use the court systems to enforce our rights and to protect digital rights. And another really important component of that is um, is activ activism, advocacy, and I'm very uh, honored to be able to work on activism for EFF. And what we really try to do is create a framework so that people, everyday people across the world, can do something positive to enforce their rights, to protect their rights. And we've done a lot of creative actions and uh, seen a lot of incredible results. I mean, the obvious one, the one that is uh, most talked about to this day, is our incredible uh, SOPA blackout, which we participated in and, and helped to, uh, to organize and bring together. But we've also had um, incredible successes, blocking bills uh, in Congress and uh, passing uh, very positive legislation on the federal level and on the state level. And so much of that is thanks to um, the incredible efforts of everyday supporters who are willing to pick up the phone and make a phone call, uh, sign a petition, or tweet at their member of Congress. But uh, actually, we, we're seeing even more than that now, which is we're seeing people willing to go uh, and show up at a town hall. And let me just say, there's nothing as impactful as showing up at a town hall and asking a question to an elected official. They, I have heard from staffers who say, you know, we throw a town hall in our home districts, and we'll have only 50 people show up. And only a few of them will want to ask questions. So literally, just taking one evening uh, out of your year and going to one of these town hall events can have a huge impact. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we also see um, people having an enormous impact by, uh, by uh, pushing for change positively within their companies. You know, a lot of people uh, who are EFF supporters are also working at some of these tech companies that uh, are making major decisions about how they collect and deal with data. And there's an a important role that uh, their, own, uh, their own employees can play in pushing for the right thing. Um, but the main thing is that we try to, whatever the, the threat is upon us, whatever the uh, problem is we're facing, whatever the opportunity is, we try to let you know what the most effective, most impactful thing is by telling you uh, uh, through our mailing list. So you can sign up through our mailing list uh, and also uh, become a, a card-carrying donor if you'd like. Uh, so I'm going to uh, remind people that we are uh, taking questions and then I'm also going to remind both myself and Danny, they want us to talk louder. I oh, hear you. Excellent. All we'll right. talk a little bit louder. Um, and then, uh, shall I? Take I, I actually, so, oh, so yes. we, we did two wings of this and I want to actually um, uh, cover something else. So, so a lot of what we've been talking about here are perhaps the, the traditional methods that we've used in the past. And I know that a lot of people are concerned that this may not be uh, an ordinary transition and this may not be an ordinary government, I think. So as Rainey explained, I'm the international director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I think it was somewhat significant um, that the first people who sent me messages um, uh, during this, this, this election were from members of the international community. And uh, EFF works in Turkey, we work in Russia, we work in um, uh, um, the edges of Syria, we support people who are targeted in those countries. And I was getting messages of um, support and solidarity. And I think that there are many people who are concerned that, that um, uh, there's potentially a risk here, that if you have the Congress and the Senate and the executive uh, dominated by one force um, that uh, we've essentially got, as, as, as EFF and many others have explained for the last few years, a huge surveillance apparatus within that executive. And that the restraint of that surveillance apparatus is held in almost entirely by internal regulations. There's very little oversight and there's very little sort of uh, external controls. And a lot of people who, who, who have opposed Trump um, are concerned that those, those boundaries um, won't hold. And they're worried about what happens with an administration that expands the surveillance network and then applies it um, domestically. We're aware of, of those concerns and, 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 and we hear them. And I think the message that I wanna say to people who are concerned about that, that in many ways, this isn't a surprise or something new to us. This is really what EFF was built for. 
This is what we've been preparing for since 1989. We've been trying to warn the world about the expansion of surveillance and the use of technology by a powerful executive. Uh, we've documented it and uh, spelled out the consequences of that from everywhere, from Kazakhstan to Ethiopia. Um, we've, uh, we've analyzed the use of government surveillance in that way, and we've attempted to protect vulnerable groups around the world. And uh, we'll continue to do that um, internationally and domestically. And the final part of our triangle is one of the ways that we do this. I think most of you probably know that here at EFF, we've built um, uh, tools like uh, uh, HTTPS Everywhere, um, like Let's Encrypt to increase the level of encryption, um, like Privacy Badger to restrict the amount of tracking that goes on. Uh, we funded Tor in its early years, and I think one of the things that people have to bear in mind is that a lot of the privacy enhancing tools that people use now to protect themselves um, are actually US government funded, and that, that government funding may, may change or, or, or vanish. Um, so part of the reorientation that we're doing here at the Electronic Frontier Foundation is to rededicate our efforts to providing technology as a final backstop. I think there are two parts of that. One is building tools, teaching people how to use those tools, and reaching out to technologists in our community to support those tools, um, to send in bug reports if you can, and send us a patch on GitHub. But also, if you're working in companies, the message that we have for companies is, you've got to encrypt now, you've got to delete your logs now, and you've got to start resisting. You've got to start resisting any expansion of government intrusions into the vast honeypot of data that Silicon Valley companies have collected that we've spent 20 years warning could easily be used by a government. Now, now we have given that warning to every um, administration and to every voter um, for the last 30 years. Um, if you're feeling it now, we understand, and uh, we just want to make it clear that we'll try and support and, and fight against um, any eventuality using the law, using activism, and using technology. And uh, Danny, that reminds me, you, you mentioned a lot of these tools are, are, are many of the tools we rely on to protect our funding, our, uh, our privacy online are, are receiving some funding from government and I think it's really important that people recognize that EFF does not take any government funding. EFF uh, relies on individual donors to, uh, to continue our work, to fight in the courts, to build technology, and to, uh, to engage in activism and advocacy. So. I'm going to ask my colleague Maggie, who has handed me a stack of questions, to please, if you could, post the donation link for our uh, for EFF into the the chat, so that anybody who's online now, if you care about these issues, if you are worried about the future of the open web, if you believe in what EFF is trying to do, please uh, please make a donation. Uh, we we can't do this work without you, and it and it means the world to us. Um, and now, as I said, I'm Rainey Reitman, and this is Danny O'Brien for people just joining. And uh, I am going to dive into some of these questions. You can join the conversation by posting uh, to the Facebook feed or by uh, tweeting at us uh, using the hashtag AskEFF. So, Danny, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to throw this one at you. I'm getting a lot of questions about net neutrality. What does the future of net neutrality look like under a President Trump? long pan over to me. It's not good. Um, so uh, I think uh, earlier on in this live chat, we, we, we talked a little bit about some of the people that we've seen in the um, uh, joining the transition team. Um, and uh, when I was talking to somebody in DC who works on these issues, to paraphrase them, they said, um, uh, this is a list of people who either I don't know or wish I'd never met. And um, the people that we do recognize are people who um, uh, have pretty set their sail pretty pretty hard against net neutrality. Um, it's not a it's not a, the hugest of issues. It's not the most partisan of issues. So in many ways, that's that's a real shame. I think that that um, you would think that this would be an administration that could recognize the importance of. Um, bringing out um, voices that are otherwise unheard in the mainstream media and, and 
uh, uh, protect and defend their ability to communicate freely online. Um, that's not the messaging that we're seeing. And I think the other thing that's important to note about net neutrality, um, at least in the, the US, is this is something that, that um, has to be proactively enforced um, uh, by, by regulators. It's not something that the government can uh, uh, step back. It's, 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 a, it's a regulation that needs to be enforced. Um, so even if, even if the, the, um, uh, the, the network neutrality was a neutral issue, um, uh, simply by paying less attention to it, um, this, this, this administration could easily let, let it fall. Um, I'm, I'm trying, as you probably noticed, to put as much optimism and uh, into, into this conversation as I can. But I have to say that, that here and in our communities, one of the things that we're, we're, we're most concerned about is net neutrality. I think we're, we're gonna, we, we, we've taken two steps back on that. We're gonna have to really fight hard. And um, maybe I can follow up. We're getting, I've gotten two questions already about, about an issue that I know is quite dear to your heart, which is the, the Snoopers Charter, the Investigatory right. Powers Bill in the UK, which it, it just passed this week. And yeah. so I'd, I'd appreciate it if you could, um, now I know you've been following this for years and you may have a temptation to spend the next 20 minutes explaining it. I and take so, your hint, Rainy. Yes. You, you, you sat with me <laughs> uh, in yes. bars about this. So um, speaking personally, this has not been the greatest week for me. Um, <laughs> as you may have noticed that I'm British and um, I, I helped co-found the Open Rights Group, which is one of the groups with Privacy International um, and uh, a squadron of people who fought a bill called the Investigatory Powers Bill in the UK. Um, partly as a result of, of, of Brexit and, and a lot of the disruption uh, within the United Kingdom, uh, that passed with, with very few amendments. We, we fought it pretty hard. Uh, EFF actually supplied some amendments um, to try and advise um, uh, those fighting it uh, in, in the UK Parliament. And I think the most important thing to bear in mind here, um, because I don't know how many of you are actually British, is that um, uh, the Investigatory Powers Bill is the first attempt after Snowden to expand, not contract or restrain um, the state surveillance system, but to actually expand and justify it. Um, what that means is, is if you see um, uh, new laws being proposed, if uh, the tack that the Trump administration takes is the tack that we saw after 9-11 of saying that we're in a national security emergency and we need more powers, um, it's going to be reflected. They're going to take it from IPB. And Rainey, apologize for, 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 for <laughs> ranting about this. The things to watch out for, and this is if you're a technologist in the uh, 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 companies as well, the things to look out for is the Investigatory Powers Bill enables and empowers the government to reach out and hack devices. So basically it gives them a carte blanche, not only the intelligence services, but also law enforcement to break into and uh, hack into computers and uh, mobile devices and turn them into surveillance tools. This is something that we were fighting with Rule 41 in the United States, and we're going to see an even bigger um, uh, move, I think, to, to widen that power. The other part of it that we're really concerned about, and Silicon Valley really, and any other technology company, has to fight terribly hard to beat, is uh, an ability to compel technologists, individual technologists within these companies, to obey commands from law enforcement and the government to insert spyware or bend or control their own technology to conduct surveillance. If you look in the investigatory power bill, um, it's called the um, uh, somewhat um, uh, uh, um, Orwellian term of interference, um, equipment interference. It's what the FBI was asking Apple to do. Um, one of the few lines that we've seen from Mr. Trump is Mr. Trump was very pro-FBI and very anti-Apple in that line, and that's the line that I think technologists and activists have to protect um, against. So, so we have some more questions. I do. I have so many questions coming in, and I actually think this is a great discussion, but I want to get to as many of these as possible. And uh, I'll do that one next. Uh, if you're just joining, I'm Rainy Reitman. I'm the activism director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm joined with Danny O'Brien, who is our international director, and we are 
We are talking about digital rights in the next few years and what that looks like under a Trump administration. And uh, you can join the conversation by simply leaving a question down below. My colleague Maggie is uh, off screen and she's handing me questions as they come in. And uh, uh, you can also tweet at us using the hashtag AskEFF. So the next one, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of versions of this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up here. Uh, should we install some form of PGP on everything quickly? And Danny, maybe we should just start there. I assume there are some folks on, on who are listening to this who simply don't know what PGP is. So let's start right there, and then we'll explain what, what is the right technical solution going forward. I hope you're not asking me to instruct people on how to install PGP. Oh, okay, if good. you could just do that real quick. Sure, sure. We've got three <laughs> hours or so. Um, so, uh, so this is definitely something that we've seen a lot of questions about. PGP, just for those of you um, uh, um, who perhaps haven't been around for 30 years, um, PGP was pretty good privacy. Um, it's a piece of software that uses strong encryption, which is a, um, a technology, um, a, a, a way of protecting communications even from very large governments with, with very um, powerful uh, surveillance abilities. It's the um, public key encryption is the very heart of how you can communicate on the internet and not only have um, uh, be uh, protect your your information as it passes through the internet from criminals um, and uh, um, other uh, uh, other parties that you wouldn't want to see your most private communications. It's also a way of protecting yourself from the government. And we've had a lot of queries from people who are now. Um, I, I would describe them as, as, as scared about the new administration and then wondering if, if they should do that. Um, going back to the, the triangle that we talked about earlier, the way to fight um, the invasion of um, your privacy um, by, by a, a, a government, by a state that you're living under is um, you use all three, and, and I, I'm the international director, so we work in, in places with um, autocratic regimes or um, repressive regimes, and that, that triangle still holds. Even if you're in the worst possible situations, you still try to fought, fight within the system with the law, you still try to publicize what's going on, but you do also use technology. So uh, what we're doing at EFF is this. We've always um, uh, conducted trainings and spread information about how to use these tools because we see these tools as a, a vital part of, um, of civil liberties and protecting human rights. So uh, we've always um, taught people about it. If you go to um, a URL um, at our uh, surveillance self-defense um, may site. Maybe I'll just ask Maggie. Sure. Maggie, Maggie's off site. She's helping us out. Thank you, Maggie, for doing this. I realize this is not typically part of the job of being the HR director for EFF, <laughs> but she's, she's been a real champ here. If you could actually just post um, the the link to our the, it's actually an amazing resource so, surveillance self defense. Do you want to explain what sure. it is? Sure. So surveillance self defense. Um, I work on the international side, and we built surveillance self defense to help people in repressive um, environments uh, protect their communications. That's why it's actually in eleven languages. Um, uh, but we've also tried to build it for people who are the most vulnerable people in any in any society, um, and. Uh, uh, it gives you guides on how to use um, a Signal, which a lot of people are switching to. I've noticed from the endless notifications from my Signal client. It's so um, true. Uh, it also explains, more importantly, not just using these tools, but how to think about um, your risk assessment, how to do what we, we call threat modeling, which is to say, okay, realistically, um, my threat model's changed. I'm now more worried about my own government than I am. Um, cyber criminals. Um, how should that change how I protect information? How does it change how I talk to other people? Because you also have to think about the privacy of other people. I think one of the things that, that we've seen that's been most drastic is people concerned for people in their family. They say, "Well, look, I'll be okay. I'm, 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 I'm. You know, I'm. I've got a good job. Um, I'm, uh, I'm. I'm. I'm white. Um, I'm. Uh, I, I'm relatively uh, in a relatively good position. But I have friends and family who I'm worried about. Well, you should think about them, and you should think if you're smart enough um, and tech savvy enough 
to be tuning into a Facebook Live feed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I think you're the person that those people are going to turn to for advice. So go to Surveillance Self-Defense, um, read about what, what you can do, think about how you can teach that to other people, and we're going to, we're, we're going to do two things. We're gonna, we, we update Surveillance Self-Defense on a, a fortnightly basis. Um, every two weeks. Is fortnightly a uh, weird it's Englishism? Not like, it's not something we say here. Okay, United every States. 14 days we update it. Um, <laughs> uh, but we update it two, two weeks. We, <laughs> we, every every farthing or two. Um, so so we update it fairly regularly, but, but the core stays the same. Um, and we're going to speed up that updating. We're going to bring in some new tools. Um, we're going to uh, re, uh, bring back sec um, the secure messaging advice that we, we've done in the past. Um, and we're also increasing training. So we do digital security training, um, and we're going to up our level of training uh, trainings. So if you're interested in that, do contact us. If we um, can't give you in your community training, um, we can try and find someone who can. Um, and we're also going to uh, increase the amount of material that is specific for um, that training. And we're specifically targeting vulnerable communities. I know people, the people who are feeling most worried in this environment right now are um, the Amer uh, United States um, Latino community, um, the Muslim community, Arab American community, um, and, uh, and I, I would say many, many activists and, we're, we're, uh, and finally journalists. journalists. Uh so, so, so my background is uh, as I've trained journalists all around the world in digital security um, at the Committee to Protect Journalists. We work closely with other organizations and um, we'll continue building tools and helping people. So I, I want to get through a couple more of these questions. Um, maybe just a, a pretty quick one. Uh, the question was, will he pardon Edward Snowden? I'm guessing, do, I'm not sure this question is about Donald Trump, I suspect it's not. I suspect it well, might be. Well, perhaps it is. I don't. What, I mean, what's your I, sense? I don't think. I don't think we have any particular insight here. There's a big campaign going on, and and went up before the election to uh, to uh, encourage um, uh, uh, the outgoing president, President Obama, to uh, to pardon Edward Snowden. Um, uh, 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 president elect Trump. Has um, has gone on the record, I think, in saying um, that he doesn't feel that Mr. Yes, Snowden should be right. pardoned. I think the big issue here, though, looking forward, and I, I know that Ed Snowden would say, always look at the bigger picture. I think the biggest worry we have is the attitude to whistleblowers, and I think one of the things that that most concerns us. Um, is that uh, uh, President Trump doesn't start from scratch here. President Trump is picking up the, um, an executive that was defined by the policies of uh, President Obama and uh, before him, President Bush. And those policies have increasingly expanded the surveillance state and clamped down on, on whistleblowers. President Obama has actually been one of the worst uh, presidents in um, um, targeting whistleblowers. So our concern really is not only um, um, the chances of, of, of setting a precedent with, with uh, Mr. Snowden, but also um, what, what new whistleblowers are going to have to face in this new administration. I think that's true. Um, and uh, so I, I want to get to a couple more of these questions. If you're just joining, I'm Rainy Reitman. I'm the activism director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm talking with I'm hosting over here uh, next to my office. Uh, I'm hosting Danny O'Brien, our international direction, director, and we're trying to recreate uh, the teach-in that we had last Friday here in San Francisco. Um, and you can join the conversation just by posting questions and we'll, uh, we'll try to answer as many as we can and also by tweeting at us using the hashtag AskEFF. So the one I'm getting the most of, the question that a lot of people are sending are a combination of, you know, how can I volunteer? And another one said, you know, what are the most effective ways for people who aren't technologists to protect our digital rights here and around the world after the election? Is that one for you? Do you want me to yeah, talk about that mean, one? I mean, I can, okay. I, can, I can talk, perhaps I can talk globally and you can talk. Okay. Russia, maybe. Well, let me, let, me, uh, let me throw some options out there. So, uh, you know, we ask ourselves all the time, what's the most effective thing that you can do? And EFF, we, we have an activism team where we, uh, we write and we educate and we always try to offer people, you know, if there is a way for you to take action on something, that it can make a difference 
will ask you to, to speak out and will we'll tell you what that would be. And um, we have had uh, incredible results from that. I um, was speaking with a, a California staffer who said, you know, if we even get five phone calls on an issue to a district office, uh, this is a, a state uh, legislator, uh, it will make a difference if we get those phone calls all in the same day. And so something as small as five phone calls to one office in a day can actually impact how legislators see these things. I think that we talked earlier, and we have it listed in the comments, about our tool, Surveillance Self-Defense. Uh, this is an opportunity to start spreading the world of word about these uh, technology tools that we use to protect ourselves and to start uh, taking action to spread the word about them. Uh, it's also an opportunity for you to start organizing in your own communities. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleague Maggie to, uh, to post a link to the Electronic Frontier Alliance. The Alliance is a grassroots organizations starting in home communities. Uh, you might have one nearby, or you might not have one nearby, and you might want to start one nearby. And we give you tools to start organizing with your friends and neighbors to educate and inspire people to care about digital rights and uh, speak out when our rights are threatened. Uh, we are trying to not just change uh, a particular bill, but to grow a movement. We are trying to create a new generation of activists willing to fight for the future of freedom online, and we're going to need your help to do it. Uh, so please, uh, uh, this is your fight as well as our fight, and uh, we need you to, to take action. I'll also put in a plug for we just launched a new version of the uh, EFF mobile app, which will give you a, a notification on your phone uh, if we have a dire need for you to speak out immediately. please. Uh, consider downloading that, and I'm also going to ask Maggie to post the link to that in the uh, in the in the comments down below. Um, and you so, want to talk about globally? Yeah. So um, so I, I, as I said earlier, I mean I'm the international director, and I've had a lot of lot of um, queries. Um, what goes on in America is of huge concern to to the rest of the world, and it can be sometimes uh, a little frustrating. I know, having watched many. American elections from the other side of the Atlantic, you feel that you, you, you don't have any power. So I want to talk a little bit about how EFF is going to reorientate our international work. Um, uh, for many years, what I think one of the prongs of what we've done at EFF is try to um, uh, capacity build, to try and uh, encourage and give support and advice to um, uh, digital rights groups in, in other countries. And, um, and that's been fantastic. I mean, Rainey talked about the movement of the um, Electronic uh, Frontier Alliance, but there's also a global movement about digital rights going on. Um, I'm uh, taking an executive action here of, of changing, <laughs> changing our, our orientation a little bit um, uh, to protecting the rest of the world. I think one of the things that people are, is, uh, are worried in this time of transition is what the United States might be doing in, in outside the United States. And so we've, we've been in this place before. Um, in the 90s, in the Clinton administration, the Clinton administration attempted to export some of the worst copyright laws mm, um, of the true. United States uh, to the rest of the world through trade agreements and through lobbying. Um, under the Obama administration, we saw um, the NSA surveillance program um, expand um, and target billions, literally billions of people around the world. Well, we're, we're going to spend our time here um, in the United States working harder to protect the rest of the world. But there's, um, uh, there's, there's a flip side to that, and that's one of the reasons why it's so good we have a global digital rights uh, network now. And that's it may well be that some of the most effective pressure on um, an expansive and, and um, uh, 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 imperial sort of executive is from other countries. We've seen, for instance, that the lawsuits of Max Schrems in Europe um, have had a really profound sort of uh, effect and made, made uh, uh, it really uh, a, a challenge to uh, what they've done is they've linked the surveillance problem to an economic issue. And I really think that one of the things that um, uh, other, other uh, activists in other countries can do is to prevent the normalization of the sort of level of surveillance that we've seen come out of the United States and, um, and push back. And we're depending on you 
here. The final thing that you can do around the world and in the United States, um, and it may not feel like it's a, it's a, a form of action, um, is, to, is to donate to, um, to, to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, so, uh, and we, we, we take all currencies, I think actually our donation person will come, no, don't, don't. We, have, we take currency and, um, and we take Bitcoin. We do. We take Bitcoin, <laughs> and we uh, and uh, we already have posted in in the links on the Facebook chat how you can. Uh, we have a special donation page that you can make a, a donation. And I'll just echo what Danny said that um, we can only get by thanks to the uh, generosity of people who believe in what we're trying to do. And if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be able to continue this important work. So I'm getting a lot of questions now. Um, again, you can you can tweet your tw questions using. Uh, the hashtag Ask EFF, or you can post them on uh, on Facebook. Um, uh, what about corporate spying? What do we think about? And I have a couple different versions of this, but what do we think about the relationship between companies and the government, and about the impact of corporations collecting data, uh, and then how that can uh, end up resulting in data flowing to the government. Do you want to kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I can, I can touch that. public so, and private sector, and maybe I'll jump in if I... Yeah, if so, I mean, again, I, I, I've said before that, you know, people have, have been saying, um, you know, are you prepared for, for the way things might, might change in the, in the next four years? And our response has been, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, we've been preparing for moments like this since the beginning of the organization. Every conversation that we ever have with um, the companies here in the United States, here in California has been, you are building a honeypot. You are building a honeypot of information. And the more information you collect, um, the more tempted um, you will be to misuse this data, for other people to break into your systems and use this data, and most importantly, a government to come in and use this data. And frequently, the response we've had is, well, don't worry, we're, we're good people. And um, the response is, well, when we work with, with government, you know, we have a, 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 a relationship with them, and, um, and don't worry, we, the information that we're sharing, we, we, we're good. Um, we're, we're good guardians of your data. Well, I think a, a, a lot of people are um, uh, rethinking that outlook, and I think they should. Um, I think that, that, that perhaps this, this election has given some people here an opportunity to think about what happens in the worst case scenario. What happens when a policy is pursued against their family and friends, and they're the people who have the data that would allow that policy to be executed in a way that they really don't want. So we are doing what we've, we've always done, which is to actively reach out to technologists and the leadership in companies that collect this enormous amount of truly damaging amounts of, of, of personal information that would be uh, a surveillance state's dream to have access to. And we're encouraging them not only to continue to resist, um, as many of them try and successfully do, resist um, the, the government's access to that data, but be more proactive. Um, uh, 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 encrypt data when it's at rest, so that not only can uh, attackers not get that data, but no one can ask them to unlock that data. Delete data when you no longer need it, and give that deletion of data under the control of users. So when users decide they no longer need, should have that data, uh, it's, that it's no longer safe in your um, your hands, um, that data vanishes and that they know that data vanishes. And once again, resist. Resist um, through the courts, resist by building technology, and resist by joining us in activism to uh, prevent the worst excesses of a, of a, 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 a draconian or autocratic presidency. Um, well, I, I have to echo that. I think that uh, we've got to look to take a really hard look at the policies of tech companies in the coming years um, but especially right now there's a you know there are things being discussed there are proposals that were made on the campaign trail that I don't think any of us know how much of that is going to, to right. play out but to the extent that there are uh, that there are uh, that there is going to be mass deportations to the extent that we are going to see uh, efforts to stifle freedom of speech 
and to the extent that we're going to see attempts to um, uh, to put people in databases based on their religious beliefs, I know the first target is going to be tech companies, and so uh, because they have such vast quantities of data. So I, I agree with you on that one. So um, I mean, another thing to do is that you know, um, ever, ever the contrarian, um, we are. I mean, we spent when. President Obama came into power. We spent a lot of time talking to folks um, who were um, uh, very optimistic and hopeful about that administration, saying, even if you are supporting um, your president at this time, yes. don't let this executive, don't, don't fall into um, uh, overconfidence. Don't let this presidency and your impatience to execute um, what you wanted that president to achieve tempt you into uh, broadening executive powers, increasing that, that president's access to personal data, increasing the surveillance state, because you, you won't like it mm -hmm. when those powers are picked up and used by the next administration to come along. Now, I'm going to say I told you so, but, 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 but uh, Here we, are. We, tot we totally understand that people now are, um, are, are a little, a little, uh, uh, more realistic about that, but it's now time for us to be annoying to those of you who may be supporting um, this administration. Don't think just because you've come in on a disruptive agenda that uh, others have ignored for years and that you think you might only have this small window of opportunity to achieve. Don't think it's a good idea to expand or weaken the safeguards or oversight because um, it's, it's four years, you don't know what's gonna happen in four years, and you really don't want the next administration to uh, walk into a, a expansive and imperial presidential power. So I just, I think I wanna ask maybe one more question. I realize we've been going a while, and so how about one more question just to, and then we'll have sort of a whatever you would like to say to wrap up, but uh, this was a, a fun one that came in. Is surveillance a good idea right now? And the, the commenter actually mentioned should everybody be wearing body cams in case they want to okay. uh, surveil the surveillers? <laughs> so, so surveillance, for those of you who don't know, it's S-O-U-S, -S, as in sous vide cooking. Um, so <laughs> um, surveillance is the idea of watching the watchers. So you have surveillance, and one of the ways to combat surveillance is you film what they're doing, you document what's going on, and that gives you a record um, if if that, that force gets abusive. Now, I, I mean, I'm not sure this is an official EFF position, but we, 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 we talk about this. Actually, I was talking with our executive director about this um, uh, earlier today, and we were talking about uh, David Brin's work on this. And I mean, our position is that um, uh, that's a great idea. Um, transparency is, is, is very important, um, but the asymmetry is always very diff difficult, right? That, that you can't simply go, um, you can use a, a, a body cam, but we have access to everybody's phone data and geolocation data, and we can pull you in at, at any point we want. Um, what I would say is that, the, again, talking about our triangle of tech law and activism, I think that you should um, sure use that technology if you want. Be cautious because one of when we've investigated body cameras, even for, for, for law enforcement, one of the things you have to consider is you're invading the privacy of other people. Right? You, if you're collecting information and what you think is, is, is power, you're also catching other people. So be cautious about that. But on the legal side of things, and one of the things that the FF is going to be spending a lot of to do is, you know, I, I think one of our first acts on January the 20th will be to send off a barrage of Freedom of Information Act requests. We're going to attempt to hold government to account um, and fight for transparency. And I think that's the kind of surveillance. And if you if you do see anything, we, uh, or, or there's something that you're concerned about um, uh, uh, that you see in your environment, um, uh, uh, write to us. Let us know. So many of our court cases vict and victories have come from somebody contacting us about um, about something that they see. This is eerily like if you see something, say something. But but maybe that's what <laughs> maybe that's what surveillance is in these situations. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I realized that we didn't want this to go too long, and I, I have a lot more questions here, so perhaps we can do another round of this um, 
maybe we'll investigate other platforms other than Facebook. I know not everybody was thrilled with this, but this was a Jitsi. Jitsi, no, yeah, we've maybe. had some, we've we've done some Jitsi calls in the past uh, with mixed results. So we're always experimenting, and this was an experiment for us. And we we thank you for joining us. And I want to just end, and I'll I'll kick it over for you to give a couple closing remarks or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but I just I want to say um, a special thank you to the twenty six thousand people who are currently. Uh, members of EFF, thank you. We can't do this work without you, and it means the world to us. And we're going to keep fighting uh, for you and for everybody who uses technology. Uh, this is our battle, and uh, the next four years might be tough, but it's going to be some of the most important work we ever do in our lives. So. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, and that is a, a club that anybody can join. So uh, you can uh, feel free to make a donation, and, and we can have maybe this time next year a heck of a lot more people that we're thanking. And um, Danny, do you just want to uh, close yeah. up with a, a couple thoughts? About I, th what I you think, think you know one of the reasons we did this is because we know that for, at least for a very large part of our, our community, they're they're worried about what they're going to see. This is this was a surprise to them, and. Um, uh, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're concerned. Um, one of the things I, I really wanted to, to, to spell out to people is that you know the, the, the best way to protect your rights is to exercise those rights. Mm -hmm. And even though uh, um, we've just posted on our blog Deep Links um, ways to protect yourself um, if you're protesting or you want to speak up, um, and one of the things that we really, where, where, wherever you are in the political spectrum, the most important thing to do is sure, protect yourself. Um, sure, um, um, take steps to protect your privacy, but don't be scared to exercise those rights. And particularly if, um, if you, you sit and conduct the risk analysis that I hope people will do, um, you realize that you're probably not the person who's going to be the, the first target in, in, in the coming future, right? It's, it's a responsibility for all of us to speak up, not only for our own rights and, and what we take for granted, um, but when we see the rights of others being targeted. Um, so keep speaking up, keep exercising in the United States your First Amendment rights, and we'll keep uh, protecting those rights um, here at the EFF.